Hello and welcome to A State of Politics, your new weekly political chat show with myself, Declan McConville, and my friend and co-host, Patrick McGill. Patrick, how are you? I'm good, how are you? I'm very well, mate. Today we are joined by Glasgow Kelvin's SNP candidate for the upcoming May election, uh, Co-Cab Stewart. co how are you doing? I'm fine. It's lovely to be here. and Thanks, Declan and Patrick. So, Coca, just give us a wee bit of background of what your career is and how you've came to the point you're at of running for the Holyrood election. Uh, yeah, well, it started uh, quite a number of years ago. Um, uh, I can't remember when I joined the party. I mean, it was decades ago. Um, but I did uh, stand in the first Scottish Parliament elections in 1999. Um, I was the candidate in uh, Glasgow Annie's Land at that time. And it was Donald Dewar, of course, who won that and went on to, you know, be the first first minister, as it were. Um, so I've got a long history of being active uh, within the SM. I did stand again um, as a candidate in uh, Leith um, and um, Edinburgh Western, I think, at that time, uh, South West at that time. Uh, so uh, and that was, um, oh, no, I can't remember his name. Um, it'll, it'll come back to me at some point. Um, so I moved back through to Ed to Glasgow um, about seven years ago and moved into Kelvin um, and was an active member here, helped in various campaigns, um, obviously the referendum uh, and uh, was very disappointed but it just fired me on and obviously a lot of other people as well because a lot of people joined the SNP after that um, and then when it came to Glasgow Kelvin um, as you know Sandra White um, has been a formidable uh, representative for Glasgow Kelvin here for a number of years and she was uh, retiring uh, so um, I got selected as the candidate to stand here so here I am. <laughs> you are. But would you say that since 1999 Scottish politics has changed dramatically since you first stood till, till this point? Um, it has changed uh, dramatically. Obviously, for Scotland, the impact of having uh, a devolved Scottish Parliament has made a huge difference. Um, I don't think that, you know, uh, it's enough, obviously. I think that we would be much better fully independent and then we have control of all the levers that we need in order to be successful. Uh, but so far, I do think that, you know, the Scottish Parliament has made a very positive impact um, on the Scottish people. It was given them uh, a taste of what it could be like uh, if we did have full control of all of our powers. And what has that been like, Coca? I've been in the SNP for so long and watching the party grow and grow and grow over the decades and eventually winning a majority, having a referendum, losing it, and then almost sort of coming out as the winners by... Uh, yeah, recruiting Patrick, so many new a, members and winning election a, after election. That's a really, really good question. Um, I mean, of course, originally I stood uh, for the SNP uh, when we had no chance of winning. Um, you know, we were sort of like considered almost like paper candidates, although I have to say that each and every one of us put our heart and soul into it. You know, uh, we fought for every single vote, um, but we were often in third or fourth place. Um, but like me and like many other activists, um, you know, we keep going because we really believe in what we're doing and we believe in independence and we believe that the SNP is the best, best vehicle to do that. Uh, when I first joined it was uh, Leaf Branch and uh, we had I think uh, about 25 members at that point um, and now uh, Kelvin has got over 1600 members so that gives uh, you know, the trajectory of how the, the party has mushroomed in that. I welcome it um, because in those days, you know, we were seen as sort of like, you know, by some people as on the fringes and weren't taken too seriously in that sense. Um, and I remember, you know, when we were going out ca campaigning or canvassing, uh, you dare not go out with your badge on it because you knew that you were going to get like abuse uh, 
in the streets or whatever. And now these days, you know, people are going out and they're very proud to wear the SNP logos and to be campaigning on behalf of the SNP. So that has changed quite a lot. Um, I love the fact that we have such a diversity of members. Um, when I first joined, I did think, you know, um, I was very much in the minority. Uh, there weren't many BAME uh, sort of like members at all and reaching out into those diverse communities um, was quite difficult and a challenge. Um, and the young didn't really uh, see what was in it for them with the SNP either and with the cause of independence. Um, so over the years, we've managed to sort of like obviously provide that positive vision but with the increase of membership, I think it's it's inspiring, you know. So the members that have joined us, I personally find them very inspiring because they're bringing um, amazing life experiences um, and very valuable uh, sort of like, you know, inputs into policy, um, which is so important. You know, the, the more sort of like diverse debates we have, um, the more robust we can be when uh, we thrash them out and uh, come up with, you know, bold and ambitious policies, which I believe is what we're doing right now. You know, looking forward to the future, you know, such an important election. Sometimes I just can't believe how far we've come, but I celebrate it. You know, I'm just delighted at how it's it's come that far. You spoke about life experience, Sir Cocab. How do you how important do you feel it's been that you've had a career in teaching um and you're now up for election into Holland? Do you feel that experience in your career could serve you well for when when you go into parliament, whether it be in committees in terms of the SNP's education strategy going forward? So during the sort of like COVID um, time, which we're still, you know, um, going through and coming out of, um, you know, I worked throughout that time. Uh, I was doing online uh, provision as well as working in the local hubs. Um, obviously, we had staff that were shielding um, and I was able to step up and say, well, I'll do more of the frontline stuff. So we all really, really pulled together. Um, and it wasn't just about what the traditional sort of education model was, you know, um, teaching them in the classroom. It was much more holistic than that. We were supporting families, you know, Schools were delivering care packages. Uh, we were making sure that the children were fed. Uh, the digital divide that was exposed um, became quite stark quite quickly. Um, in Glasgow, um, I mean, we've got the highest sort of like rollout of digital devices anyway, but that still wasn't enough. And we were also finding that uh, families didn't have uh, sort of data packages that were adequate. So even internet connections, and we were able to provide those, you know, um, and that was a lifesaver. Keeping in contact with the families through a sort of pastoral way meant that if families were struggling, we were able to pick that up and bring those children in. Uh, so I've learned a lot. Uh, you know, I've been teaching in ways that I've never taught in before, and I've been a teacher for 30 years. So I've seen it change so much over the years. I think my reflection is that you know, um, people knock education so easily. And I think that they do a real disservice to our young people and to the staff that work in schools day in, day out. And I'm very careful to try and always say staff because it's not just the teachers, it's also the janitors, it's the cleaners, it's the learning assistants, it's all the support staff that come in, you know, the additional support workers. It's all of those people, um, you know, that are required uh, to do that. Uh, so the education policies going forward, um, I write a monthly column for the Scots Independent newspaper and over the last year or so I've sort of muted some ideas about, uh, you know, how uh, education uh, could be improved further um, and, you know, uh, sort of like local school uh, hubs, what we found, you know, people were we were trying to cut down on travelling um, and I was thinking, well, maybe it's time to debate that idea of sort of like, you know, the catchments of local schools. Because um, at the moment, you know, um, there is that parental choice that you can enrol in any school you want. But that can often mean that 
you know, people are traveling by car and then we end up with all these cars outside schools. We're trying to promote walking to school, more active travel and to cut down on emission zones in particular outside schools and traffic. So maybe that's an idea that, you know, um, I could possibly bring to the table going forward. Um, I welcome the, you know, the digital devices uh, for uh, all the children from primary up to secondary. People have sort of like, you know, they're very quick to dismiss it and uh, say, oh, yeah, but, you know, what about this and what about that? But actually, um, they're not being very creative about what children use these digital devices for. It's not a replacement for textbooks and jotters. I mean, we have young people who are engaging in sort of like science, technology, engineering and mathematic activities. And they're using these digital devices to actually design uh, new technologies. Um, I mean, you know, we do loads of lessons on, you know, sort of basic stuff of how to build bridges and they're actually able to trial and error different ways of doing it in a virtual way, which I think is amazing. You know, it really taps into their creativity and they're not frightened of making mistakes. You know, um, I had children, I used the COVID as a, a context and uh, with all the public information broadcasts that were going out, um, I got the children to make their own uh, sort of version of uh, child-friendly uh, information about how to keep safe during COVID. Um, so they were able to use their digital devices to learn filming skills, to learn editing skills, um, presentation, uh, making up storyboards. Uh, it was amazing for their literacy, you know, uh, talking, listening, reading, writing, everything came into that. Um, real contextual learning. So digital devices are an invaluable tool, you know, in, in many ways, you know. Um, so I'm delighted about that. I'm absolutely delighted about that. You said earlier about um, the SNP getting more BAME members. Uh, I saw you are on a documentary by the BBC about BAME women in Parliament and how there haven't been any when there should have been, I think, 12 was the number. Yeah. Uh, how disappointed are you that that hasn't happened so far and how excited, you could say, are you that there could be several women elected this year? In 1999, when I first stood, um, I was the first BAME woman to uh, stand uh, for the Scottish National Party, full stop. Um, and as I said, I mean, I was realistic about my chances that I wasn't going to get selected, at, you know, um, elected at that point. Um, however, I have to say it has been disappointing um, that uh, a breakthrough um, hasn't been made uh, for BAME women in particular. Um, I do, you know, note that it took many, many years for the party to even adopt the 50-50 gender balance in uh, representation of our elected members. Um, and it's, it's interesting to note that that didn't benefit BAME women. So that clearly demonstrates that actually BAME women have that added uh, sort of barrier as well. You know, so it's not just gender, it's also to do with race as well. And often uh, for BAME women, um, there can be cultural aspects um, as well, which we shouldn't be frightened of talking about. You know, the expectations on sort of like, you know, an Asian woman, for instance, is that politics uh, isn't considered to be a suitable career. Uh, you know, a more traditional, like a doctor or a teacher, <laughs> you know, those seem to be more acceptable, but not politics. But I always say, well, you know, um, sort of politics actually affects every aspect of everybody's life. And if you want those policies and the way that your country is governed to be better matched to your needs, then you need to be represented. You need to be visible in the parliament. Uh, so I'm delighted that, you know, the SNP has taken that brave and bold step to actually test the system and to put in uh, mechanisms um, that uh, give uh, BAME candidates the best possible chance, um, you know, because you can't guarantee, you know, it's an election, um, you know, it's a democratic process, but to be able to 
give uh, BEM candidates and disabled candidates as well um, the best possible chance of being elected. I think that's to be applauded. Um, but it's just another example of how I do believe that, you know, the SNP is committed uh, to equalities and making sure that, you know, uh, the the picture I was, you know, say to people, uh, look at the Scottish Parliament um, in, you know, in maybe a few in a month's time or so, you know, in a few weeks' time and look at the people that are getting elected. You want that picture to be a portrait of the nation of Scotland. And at the moment that's not what it looks like. But that's our vision, you know, that's my vision is to have that picture to be that portrait that looks like Scotland. Yeah, I am sure we all definitely agree that we want a, a Scottish Parliament which really represents Scotland and even since the, the creation of the Scottish Parliament, Scotland as a nation has grown to an extent which maybe some of us would never have envisaged, but you know, it's a country that a lot of different nationalities combine in. And I think that's one of the most unique things about Scotland, that we're a welcoming country and that's been seen over the past 22 years since the creation of Holyrood. Since we're talking about um, being candidates at Proca, it kind of takes us on nicely to our news section of the show where we're talking about COVID. Now, amongst ethnic minorities, certainly, the vaccine take-up seems to be lower. Mm -hmm. Is that a concern for you? And do you think there's anything that the government could possibly do a bit more to, to encourage people? I know there's been different ads put out in television and stuff to try and encourage people, but do you think there's anything we can do to, to try and get that take-up going a bit faster? Yeah, um, it is a concern um, and I understand those concerns. I don't share them. Um, I've had my vaccine. Um, I've had my part one. Um, uh, but I, I do understand that people will be very suspicious um, and the concerns that they've raised, um, you know, are the ones that actually, you know, some other people have raised as well about the the speediness of how they came to be and you know not being able to anticipate the long-term effects of it um and also you know people from different countries as well have different experiences of medical interventions um so they they do have a suspicion of them so to me as an educationalist it always comes down to education is to make sure that people have the facts in a clear and manageable way um, and to actually spend the time with them uh, to listen to the concerns and take them seriously and not dismiss them uh, and to answer the questions that they have in a logical way. Now, uh, that sounds easy and it sounds obvious. However, uh, there are uh, language barriers um, and cultural aspects that we have to be sensitive to. So I think um, so far, I think the government have done a reasonable job um, and there have been adverts and things um, However, I think it's down to community leaders. This is where they can step up and have an influence. You know, uh, people, uh, you know, at the local mosques, for instance, um, through those channels. I know during COVID times, people are not meeting communally, obviously, um, but through Zoom, through informal chats, through the WhatsApp groups, because all these channels are actually translated automatically into yeah. the person's first language. Uh, so I think much more use of that can be done. Uh, I know I'm on the BAME network and the BAME network have been uh, trying to make sure that you know most of their output is actually in as many different community languages as possible. Uh, and also I think getting uh, sort of like Kent faces, you know, to be showing a good example and reassuring people to get that critical mass going. The challenge, of course, is that because we have so few uh, sort of like, you know, people of colour that are represented, uh, you know, in mass media, then finding them and putting them front and centre is a challenge. So then you have to change that as well. Uh, just on that, um, there's been a lot of talk recently about vaccine passports. I think there's going to be a vote in the House of Commons, and I think Nicola said today that she's going to consider it in Scotland. Uh, what is your view on vaccine passports? 
Well, so, you know, my gut feeling when I heard about it was absolutely not. Um, you know, uh, I just feel that it's a, it is a total infringement um, in that sense. However, um, there is the pragmatic view as well, is looking at the bigger picture. And it's not just about me. It's not, you know, if we've learned anything, um, it's not just about the individual. You know, the individual's needs um, are very important. Um, but uh, maybe we have to sacrifice some of the wants bits because the needs are essential, but the wants are, are not essential. Um, so, you know, um, you know, I think Nicola's right. I think she's also taking the pragmatic view that it is definitely something that is worth looking at and exploring, but I would be very cautious um, that it doesn't exclude people because that's the last thing we want you know um if we've learned anything we've got to you've got to take people with you it does require mass commitment um and generally speaking i have to say that scotland has been fantastic you know um it has complied with the lockdown regulations and uh you know the uptake of the vaccine um generally speaking has been great um and that is all helping uh I am cautious is that, you know, it's business driven rather than health driven. And mm -hmm. so far, um, I think that we've done a very, very good job in sticking to the medical evidence of that. So my default position is that I would like to see more of the medical evidence that they would be effective rather than it be, be business driven, you know, in that sense. I think the worry, co-cab as well, myself, I'm 21, Patrick's 20. I'm lucky enough to have had my first jab. Patrick will be probably another couple of months away as young people will be the last in the queue if it does come to COVID passports. And yeah. for things like gigs and football or whatever, eh, theatres, we are going to be the people that are left behind. So I think there's that worry of exclusion for, for young people. But on um, being driven by the, the stats and the health, um, do you think that, this new idea of two COVID tests a week. I know Nicola Sturgeon mentioned it today in her, her daily briefing. Do you think that's something that will put a lot more people's mind at ease? I know who last year had said that test, test, test. Do you think this is one of the other ways in which we can get ourselves out of this situation? Well, um, I think that not one solution is going to solve this. Um, it's going to take, you know, uh, sort of like a raft of different uh, things that we're going to have to do. Um, you're referring to the lateral flow testing. So teachers yeah. have been offered that since we uh, went, you know, primary schools have been back full time um, for the last three weeks up until the Easter holidays. Um, and I hear today that you know, uh, most other people apart from uh, in the shielding categories are coming, pupils rather. <laughs> I always refer to them as people, which I think is probably the, the healthier it's a way. Good thing. Yeah. <laughs> I know it's a good thing. I always say people. <laughs> and say, Who are you talking about? Oh, young people. <laughs> um, but yeah, the, so um, as far as I am aware, you know, the lateral flow tests um, give you an indication. Um, but I'm also wary that, uh, you know, the they're not providing a clear-cut result as the traditional tests that you get done. And my worry would be that although it's one indicator, it shouldn't be taken on its own. Um, you know, the sort of like the effectiveness rate, we would have to look at the percentage, you know, of that, the margin of error, um, you know, the, the sort of like the double, the double negative or the double positive result, you know, it's a complicated one. So I think it's one sort of like tool in our armory, but I don't think that we should be over reliant on it um, in that sense. Uh, in the last couple of weeks, um, you've obviously been campaigning for you to win the Glasgow Kelvin seat, but you've also been promoting a both votes SNP strategy to win as many seats as possible for the party. Uh, there are of course now two other independent supporting parties in Scotland and they are advocating for list votes to win a super majority for independence. Why do you think it's important that people use both votes for the SNP instead of splitting their ticket? Well, from my point of view, um, you know, I've been at this for a very long time. So um, I've uh, seen, you know, uh, 
try, trying to game a system that was actually not designed to be gamed, if you know what I mean, um, I think uh, leads you into all sorts of sort of like, you know, tricky, tricky waters. Um, and uh, I'm quite au fait with my understanding of the Dahon system. Um, and in this particular case, the, there's two issues. One is about trying to gain the system, which I don't think is possible. Um, and secondly, I think that, uh, you know, what what is a super majority? You know, all these sort of like uh, words get uh, bandied about to make them sound uh, exciting and all the rest of it. Um, gaining that independence is actually quite a serious and hard work business where we have to persuade the majority of the Scottish people that independence is the, you know, the, well, first of all, the right to be able to choose um, is uh, what we want. You know, it's not up to Boris Johnson to decide, it is up to the Scottish people to decide their own future. So at this particular election, that's what, you know, we're campaigning on. And uh, if we get a majority, uh, then um, we are able to, well, we've already put forward the referendum bill and Nicola has made it very clear that it's not at the compromise of the COVID recovery, because obviously that's front and foremost and so it should be um but you know fingers crossed everything going well in the first half of the next term of the parliament um so uh we have the greens and i personally think that uh you know uh, the very valuable part of the uh, scottish parliament and um, the SNP have, and the Greens have worked together, you know, for instance, on getting the budget through and, you know, various other policies, there's been cooperation there. Um, so I don't think that, you know, adding uh, another party into that mix actually helps it any further um, in that case really um and for both votes SNP you know the first vote is for your constituency right so who do you want as your MSP in your constituency and your second vote is who do you want to govern Scotland and I want the SNP to govern Scotland so on that ticket is the you know the both votes SNP for me is very very clear and plus remember is the SNP after all these years remember we were so small and you know people have they ever listened to us well you know now we're a party of government and have been and we are considered uh you know serious you know politicians and a serious political movement across the world and uh the route to independence you know has to be legitimate and we have to be able to uh, pursue it through a process that is legal and legitimate and recognised across the world. And we can do that. It's the SNP that can do that. You mentioned there, you know, the creation of this new Alaba party, COCAB, and you've probably seen people go over to Alaba in recent weeks, some that you may know. Has that disappointed you? Because I'm sure in some constituencies, in some areas, there have been some people who will have campaigned hard for that candidate and now they're leaving the SNP and they may not have campaigned for that candidate. Do, do you feel in such, those areas anyway, um, I know there is one MP in particular that's did that, that there should be a by-election because he no longer represents the party that he once stood for? Well, I'm not um, going to speak about specifics or specific people. Um, I think I, I am quite happy to talk about the general principle of it. Um, and certainly, you know, um, I feel that if you have campaigned and you have been elected on a specific party ticket, um, and let's not forget the hardworking activists that have yeah. gone out and believed in you, you know, you've stood at the hostings, you've asked to be selected as the candidate to represent the SNP, and you've been uh, selected and elected on that ticket. I think that if it comes to a time where you feel that you no longer can align yourself with the policies and the values of that party, then that is your free choice. We live in a you know democratic society and people can change their minds. However, then I feel that you know it would be appropriate to give the voters a choice as to what they want. Um, 
I know that, you know, sort of like, and, uh, you know, lots of resources go into um, electing candidates. And as much as I would like to think, uh, you know, uh, that, you know, everybody loves me and they're voting for COCAB and all the rest of it, you know, um, you know, I'm not, so sort of, I, I know that people are voting for the SNP and, you know, in Kelvin, I'm the representative of the SNP and I take that very, very seriously. Um, so I think that, you know, you have to be able to put that ego aside um and but if you genuinely believe that you're the right person and people will follow you then give the choice to the electorate you know i believe in democracy ultimately so the the it should be done to the people to make the choices um and as far as the appearance of uh you know the alba party in general um you know, again, the principle is that I believe in democracy. And, you know, if people uh, want to get together and they feel that they have common values and they want to campaign on an issue, um, then, you know, um, I, I have no issue with that as a matter of principle. And, you know, uh, when we're independent, I hope that we do see the rise of sort of like many different parties and we have lots of cooperation across different parties. I mean, you know, they manage it in lots of small countries, independent nations uh, in Europe. So going forward, you know, that could be in the future uh, helpful. Uh, while talking about other independent supporting parties, uh, Patrick Harvey of the Greens finished uh, second in Glasgow Kelvin five years ago. Uh, for sort of centre left independent supporters, why should they vote for you over Patrick Harvey in Glasgow Kelvin? Yeah, uh, I mean, Patrick's a great guy. You know, I've got a lot of respect for Patrick um, and he's got a lot of experience. Um, however, I would say that so do I. Um, you know, being an educationalist for 30 years, um, what I can offer going forward, um, you know, as I uh, sort of alluded to earlier, um, I do think that we have, you know, a, a, a great education system where lots of people are knocking their pan in to, you know, close the attainment gap and address the complex issues um, that are not going to be done through sound bites. You know, um, the view from the classroom, I think I can add a lot to that. Um, and uh, certainly, you know, in Kelvin, we have a very uh, diverse mix, just like most sort of constituencies. Um, but, you know, we're lucky enough that we've got lots of amazing universities and colleges here. Um, and, you know, the, the young people are very, very important um, in that sense of being not only uh, community activists, but residents, um, you know, uh, learning and contributing, um, but also, you know, we have a duty to represent them. And I feel that although, you know, I'm sort of like the other side of 50, um, I would like to think that I can connect with not only young people, um, but, you know, lots of diverse communities within uh, Kelvin. We've got the third highest uh, percentage of uh, people who were born out with Scotland. Um, uh, the the first one with the highest is Glasgow South, um, and then I think it's Edinburgh Central, and then the third is Glasgow Kelvin. So we've got a real mix of uh, people here, you know, um, and to have a candidate who actually crosses quite a lot of those um, sort of like demographics, I suppose, I think is uh, a, a very refreshing sort of like, you know, uh, person to have on the table. Um, and also uh, we've got COP26 coming up, um, which I think is a, a, a wonderful opportunity for Glasgow to really showcase, you know, its um, commitment uh, to, you know, uh, reducing emissions, um, going carbon neutral, um, and with all our educational establishments, again, to highlight and showcase all the amazing sort of like technological um, sort of advancements and research that they are doing into uh, sort of like, you know, alternative of fuels of the future, um, you know, harnessing the, the wind power, the waves that we have, um, and believe it or not, you know, a wee bit of solar energy, we do get the sun, so, you know, we can capture that as well. Um, but, uh, yeah, so we we have a lot to offer, you know, um, and in Glasgow Kelvin, um, 
sort of earlier today, uh, I was talking about, you know, Glasgow City Council during COVID um, shut off uh, lots of streets and stuff, and especially Kelvin Way, um, made that open to uh, pedestrians and to cyclists, and that's now been extended. And I hope that actually it stays that way. Um, you know, people mump and moan about it, sort of like for a wee bit at the beginning. And I understand it's, con you know, it's inconvenient. And then people see the bigger picture. Um, and also having uh, this sort of like 20 minute sort of like uh, sort of hub thing, you know, around where you live. If we can make sure that we've got sort of like local businesses um, and local services that you can walk to within 20 minutes, um, I think that's fantastic. You know, so and Nicola Sturgeon invest. You know, uh, just the other day she was at Roots and Shoots uh, within the constituency and was announcing, um, you know, the ex and I think it was ten million pounds to act specifically target towards supporting local businesses. Uh, so I think that we have a lot to offer, and from the centre left, I think that. You know, so it's not just the 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 greener and the fairer, um, but it's also about independence. You know, um, the Greens have independence as part of their manifesto, but they, you know, uh, say themselves that they are not defined by it. Whereas the SNP, it is, you know, uh, one of our core core principles um, that you know, over the years I've seen us sort of like move from being a pressure group, uh, from an issue group. To actually being a party of governance and having the full raft of policies that are needed to actually govern uh, a modern country, you know, um, a modern progressive country. Uh, and we know that we've pushed that to the limits and we want to now take that further as a fully independent nation. So, um, yeah, for me, uh, we're sort of like, you know, uh, independence is right there and that it's it's very important for me as well um especially since i've been campaigning for it for so long uh or not as long as some as people always point out to me they say oh okay, Cap, yes you've been around for you know 25 years it's, it's not as long as me and i think yes and you know our movement is built on the shoulders of giants you know we've had many activists gone before us who have sort of you know handed the baton on for you know the next generations to take on <laughs> I think Cocab, that space at, at Kelvin where you're talking about, I know really well living in the constituency that you're, you're hoping to represent. So one of the other SNP policies is this um sixty million pounds to to playgrounds. I know some people would maybe snub that, but why do you think that is so important? Because these are spaces which of course right in the middle of Kelvin Grove Park and right all around you the constituencies of Kelvin. So why why do you think that's a really important policy? Um, I think, well, uh, sort of, you know, play is actually a right. It is a fundamental right of a child, the right to play in a safe space. Um, we know that that sort of like helps with socialization, it helps with mental health, um, you know, their personal and social uh, development, um, you know, all of that it puts into it. Um, also with general health and fitness as well. So if we're being proactive and we want our children um, to be healthy, uh, then, you know, prevent. this is part of that preventative health measure, um, as well as being, uh, you know, a, a great social thing for them. Um, and, um, yeah, so I've sort of lost my, yeah, the UNC, uh, UNCRC, we have adopted that into sort of Scottish law. Um, and I did think on an aside that it was very interesting on the very day that, you know, we decided to adopt that into Scottish law, uh, Westminster uh, turns around and tells us that they're spending X billions of pounds in, you know, nuclear uh, warheads. And I thought, well, there goes, you know, the stark, that shows you the stark difference between the two governments here, you know, for one matter. Um, but yeah, if we're going to, well, we are uh, enshrining the rights of the child, then the right to play is actually a fundamental right. It's not a treat, you know, and we've learned that during COVID as well, you know, children being isolated from their friends, having to stay in. Um, and we know that that has affected the mental health well-being of entire families. Um, so I think it's essential. Um, 
Well, when in the, the dim and distant past, when I used to go abroad, um, in many countries, uh, there are, you, you can't go for like maybe two or three blocks without coming across a safe football area. Uh, you know, uh, and you don't find the signs, no ball games here. I, I hate those signs. I just think, you know, it's ridiculous. And yet, you know, we're like, hopefully, uh, trying to provide opportunities for our young pe people to sort of like develop their football skills or any other, you know, sports skills. And yet from a young age, we're giving them these messages that actually kind of kick a ball about here. Well, why not? You know, um, because it might be inconvenient to some people. I understand that. But then there are mitigations that you can put in. You know, you can put up sort of like higher fences and things, you know, solve the problem, you know, be creative. Uh, you know, and even children falling, health and safety, I can understand that. But you get, you know, great uh, ground stuff that you get where, you know, they just bounce up now. You know, it's it's okay. Um, and how do children learn to take risks and, you know, develop the self-confidence um, if they can't fall off something and pick themselves back up, be reassured, be nurtured and carry on, you know, and learn that resilience in a healthy outdoor way. So play is the way. <laughs> uh, you've spoken about your background in teaching and education. Uh, the Conservative Party, I think two or three days ago, uh, pledged a total of £1 million to help uh, bridge the attainment gap. Uh, how far do you think that £1 million will go? I think what that exposed to me was the fact that the Conservatives really don't understand the complexities that are involved in bridging that attainment gap. Um, and I think I'm quite, you know, I'm proud of the fact that the SNPs, you know, um, set that very ambitious target to close it um, uh, because it has to be something that we can work towards. And as a teacher, I know uh, what it actually takes and it takes a whole community uh, to do that. Uh, people have this very narrow view that it's just about a teacher in front of children, you know, doing numeracy and doing literacy. Um, so the children that are not succeeding at the moment or are finding difficulty or, you know, facing the barriers, those barriers are multiple and sometimes they can be generational. And, you know, I always think of sort of like, if you think about Maslow's hierarchy of needs, you know, going into that, <laughs> but it's important because if you have families and children that are worried about what they're going to eat, they're not living in secure accommodation. Um, you know, their health is not good. They've got damp and that's giving them asthma. Um, they may have disabilities. They may have undiagnosed conditions. Um, there may be domestic violence. There may be drug abuse. There are a whole range of issues that, you know, families and children don't obviously present with that. So we have to build those relationships and build the confidence to be able to do that. Teachers cannot do that alone. So in order to bridge the, you know, to further improve, uh, and we have made progress in spite of what the opposition parties say, we have made progress um, on, uh, you know, uh, closing that gap. Um, and we need to go much further, but it takes a long time. It's not a quick fix. And I'm glad that we're actually investing the time and effort into doing that, you know, providing extra funding for CAMS, for instance, um, and I would like to, you know, if if I'm elected, um, I'd like to be at that table to actually ask for further action on supporting uh, more community workers that can actually reach out and, you know, uh, work with families um, to also get uh, a more holistic model. You know, um, my vision would be, I suppose, of having sort of like, you know, uh, community hubs where maybe based at the local secondary school, you could have access uh, to a health professional, a social worker, a community worker, um, you know, a specialist provision, a, a counsellor, for instance, so that when we do get issues that come to us, we are able to provide that rapid response and we're able to support the families to actually um, get the access because often you know the families feel so disenfranchised and they feel so disempowered and they lack the confidence that even if the services are there they don't take them up 
So if we can, you know, make sure that the children are well fed, that they're in good, affordable, secure, safe housing, um, they have the right to play, and you know, um, they have that nurturing view, then if all those things are in play, uh, that are, you know, there, then a child will learn. You know, they, I mean, they learn anyway. Let's not, you know, again, let's not downplay that. They are sponges um, and they do their absolute best. Uh, but as adults, it's up to us to provide that holistic uh, support model in order to further improve that attainment gap. And frankly, £1 million pounds doesn't cover any of that. It's an insult, actually. So, in contrast, COCAB, the SNP is committed to a youth guarantee and the First Minister is also committed to keeping tuition free. How important do you think that is? I know myself and Patrick have benefited greatly off free tuition, mm. as have many um, university students across Scotland present and past. How important do you think that youth guarantee is going to be for the future recovering from COVID? Well, I think it's going to be essential, um, and I'm glad that you've both benefited from it. Um, I'll I'll sort of take you back. When I was at university, um, I could not, um, I got a full grant, it paid for my all four years, and I could not have gone, uh, my family was not able, I was the first person to from my family to go to university, and I would not have been able to attend had I not got a full grant. Um, in those days, uh, we uh, also, uh, yes, yeah, so the grant, I've mixed up my words there, um, the, the, the fees were paid for, but I got a full grant as well. And I remember it was £2,500 a year, and um, uh, this will shock you. Um, after four years of university and getting £2,500 a year as a full grant, uh, I had one part-time job. Uh, I worked one day a week. Uh, I came out of university and I was 50 quid overdrawn. And in those days, 50 quid was, was uh, you know, quite a lot of money. I have to say you could go out on a fiver. <laughs> You know, for an entire night. Um, so I know how essential it is. Taking advantage of that, as a qualified teacher over the last 30 years, I couldn't put a number on how many children I have educated. And those children have now grown up, have gone through the system and are contributing into society. So that is the ripple effect of investing in education and making sure that there is equal access on, you know, the ability um, uh, rather than the affordability of it. Uh, the the youth guarantee scheme I think is fantastic because um, it actually gives uh, equal emphasis to sort of like you know positive outcomes in a variety of ways um, because university isn't for everybody. And I think that, again, we do sort of like, you know, the uh, sort of the apprenticeships um, and formal volunteering opportunities, um, we do them a disservice. Um, you know, we're sort of like, um, you know, trying to constantly pump uh, higher and further education, which I believe in naturally. But I also recognise that if you're truly valuing an individual in front of you, you know, what if they're interested in the creative arts? You know, what if they're interested in sport? You know, what if uh, they're interested in plumbing? You know, um, am I going to be the one to say, well, actually, that's not good enough because we only measure our success based on how many people go to university? I mean, that's ridiculous. You know, so to be able to sort of put those things on an equal footing and to say, do you know what, if you want to go um, into building and you can get an apprenticeship into that, um, that is fantastic. You know, and volunteering. COVID has told us that we have, as a nation, a great capacity to look out for each other. Um, and, you know, volunteers, the amazing work that they do. And to have that supported and funded the skills that young people are learning, which they can then take into, you know, further employment and transfer their skills. So I think it's a brilliant investment. Um, absolutely fantastic. Just talking about different policy pledges that the SNP have made so far in the campaign, obviously the big one would be a second referendum on independence. And Nicola Sturgeon has said she wants to have that in the first half of the parliamentary term. If Nicola Sturgeon goes to Boris Johnson for a Section 30 order and he says no, what does the Scottish Government, assuming that the SNP win the election, do, do then? 
Well, I so, uh, yeah, I mean, the thing is, he will say no. <laughs> you know, yeah, I mean, he's probably. not... <laughs> You know, he's not going to say no. I mean, that that is the thing. Um, so, uh, well, I mean, obviously, uh, uh, it would be nice. Um, however, uh, that that's not what the Tories do. You know, we can see that on the election trail so far is that, you know, I've, I've had a leaflet come through my door today um, and it actually talks more about independence than even I could. You know, <laughs> how is that possible? Uh, so, you know, considering it's something that they don't want uh they mention it an awful lot um but you know it, what they want to do is to protect the status quo um and uh you know we're not settling for the status quo because we know that we can do much better than that um i think that uh what will happen is that uh the people of scotland will demand you know that we move forward and he has to then enter into formal negotiations because remember um the eyes of the world are going to be upon him so this is a democratically elected leader um that is denying another democratically elected leader who has just recently hopefully been given an overwhelming mandate to put the referendum question on the table and for him to turn around and deny that. I'm not how would that work legally even you know I mean would he be allowed to do that how would that you know there's loads of different prisons of ways of looking at that in that sense um so Again, and, and I've talked about it in the past, that's why sort of voting for the SNP is the legitimate, because we are the legitimate negotiating body for that. So therefore, you know, um, I, I don't think that he will be able to deny it. I think that he will. There will be lots of bluster and all the rest of it. Um, but I think that, you know, who could deny, you know, uh, sort of like a clear majority of the Scottish people sort of like wanting uh, a referendum, uh, you know, not in a generation, not in this, not in that. I mean, you know, we're out of Brexit. We were told that, you know, uh, that wouldn't happen, that's happened. Um, so people are not fooled, uh, you know, um, and we have a democracy and we would be using the democratic channels to pursue that. But COVID recovery comes first. I want to emphasise that. So on COVID recovery, COCAB, if you were elected to Holyrood, what would your vision be of Glasgow Kelvin for the next five years and what would your vision be for, for Scotland for the next five years? Well, probably a mirror um, of those. I mean, obviously, sort of, I'm interested in education, um, so that is part of my top three, um, would be to make sure that, you know, um, the education system recovers from that um, and, uh, you know, any learning gaps that are there. And I have to say that having been back at school and having, uh, you know, been amongst young people um, is not nearly, you know, the leakage is not nearly as bad as some of the doom and gloom people who are saying, oh, you've lost an entire generation of children. You're really doing our young people a, a, a huge disservice at how resilient they are and how hardworking our staff are. You know, you know, that's our bread and butter. That's what we do. So, you know, let us do our jobs and we can help with that. So I think, you know, the investments um, in education, I think, are very important. Um, uh, the slightly trickier issues, obviously, is when it comes to assess uh, things and universities, um, you know, and how uh, they're going to sort of like, you know, provide the, the passes and the exams and things. Um, I would argue that, you know, maybe there is too much emphasis on exams and maybe there should be a wider repertoire of how we assess our children. Of course we need to, you know, you, you need to have the qualifications that are meaningful and are accepted uh, legitimately. Um, but there are different models that we can look at across the world for that. You know, the International Baccalaureate, for instance, is one example um, that we could explore further. Um, the other thing um, in Kelvin is going to be, we've got a lot of small businesses and creative industries um, here. 
and uh, I know that they have really, really suffered. And whilst, you know, uh, the government has done its best, I absolutely recognise that there's been loads of small businesses that have fallen through that net um, and the Barnet consequentials have simply not been enough to be able to pass on. Um, and I know, for instance, you know, like news agents, um, uh, they uh, were deemed to be essential businesses, so they were able to stay open. However, the footfall just disappeared overnight so uh the effect on them uh has just been horrendous and glasgow kelvin covers the city center so in the city center you know i have spoken to sort of like business owners and some uh you know really tragically uh have decided to give up uh their business because they weren't able to you know get the funding that they needed um and you know it, it wasn't good enough there you know are definitely lessons that we can learn um for the future to make sure that you know uh there are sort of like structures in place financial structures to support and nobody falls through the net but clearly some businesses have fallen through the net um there was the discretionary funding which was allocated to the councils um but i do recognize that that wasn't enough um but i was glad to see that i think sandra white did put in a question about it and there was extra funding that was released um which was you know of some help to some businesses um so education supporting small businesses and uh, active travel um, within uh, Kelvin um, as well. Um, it's been great to see, you know, cycle lanes being uh, coming up. I mean, in Clarence Drive, um, you know, they've put in sort of like more cycle routes um, and I'm seeing them expanded. Uh, and, uh, you know, again, that connectivity is very important, but we've also uh, got some of the highest emission zones because again, we cover the city centre um, and that's not acceptable. You know, we've got census in Byers Road and you can see by the reduction in traffic during COVID, the, the stark reduction of uh, the emissions that were there. So, you know, there is a direct correlation there. Um, so that's something that I would like to see is uh, safer routes um, and having, uh, you know, people being able to cycle and to walk safely um, and to try and reduce the traffic. And I say that as a car driver, you know, I know it's difficult decisions um, and, you know, things are inconvenient and, you know, uh, when something comes up, you think, oh, no, no, because again, our, our instinct is to protect the status quo. But we know we can't do that because it's affecting the, the physical health um and the planet you know uh and we've got very ambitious targets in glasgow which actually exceed even the scottish government's ones and in order to reach those we are going to have to make these decisions which i believe will pay off uh, just finally for me um you were talking there about uh, how young people have not been in school uh, quite a lot recently because of the coronavirus pandemic uh, I think the Greens are proposing uh, children start school at the age of seven instead of four and five. Uh, as a teacher in the classroom, with all your experience, do you think that's something that could be workable? It was actually um, sort of uh, one of the ideas that I put in my uh, Scots Independent articles. Um, I think it was about six or seven months ago I wrote about that idea. Um, uh, you'll know by now that I'm a great advocate of play um, and learning through play. And uh, I think that, you know, also having done um, a bit of research across Europe and having spent time in places like Italy um, and various other countries um, as well, uh, and lots of countries uh, have that sort of like uh, more of the kindergarten model. So I was very interested to hear that from greens uh so it's not a new idea um but it's great that you know they're putting it forward um and agree with you know something i published sort of quite a few months ago on that i think it's definitely something you know if we're looking at reshaping so we talk 
we talk about rebuilding, we don't have to rebuild the same. We can actually sort of like, you know, uh, be innovative, be imaginative and think, well, actually, uh, we could do things differently. You know, it's the, the education system has been stress tested during COVID. So the bits that, you know, haven't coped so well, maybe those are the things that, you know, we should look at um, in the future. So I think there's a lot of merit in that. Um, child development theory. Um, if I bring that into it a little bit, um, you know, sometimes I do sort of like look at some of the stuff that we're teaching our young children that are sometimes four and a half, you know, when they come to school, depending on when your birthday is. And the stuff that we're asking them to do and assessing, by the way, you know, doing standardized testings for five year olds and everything, um, not all of that actually fits with uh, child development theory you know, which has been tried and tested. So there's clear evidence that actually a child isn't ready to learn that particular concept or to do things in that way by that time. Um, so I'd like to think that, you know, if I was part of that table where you're having that debate, to have somebody with that kind of knowledge to be saying, well, actually, this isn't how it really works, you know, right there in front and center, I think that would be a big bonus. So, so yeah, I think it's definitely something worth exploring. The reasons in the past when it's been raised um, and people have been skeptical about it is that I do think it's unfortunate that there is an element that still links uh, primary school education with childcare. And people always worry about the fact that, oh, well, if they're not at school, then, you know, I need to work, I need to do this. Now, childcare is very important in its own right. And education is important in its own right, you know. So for me, the, there isn't that conflict there. Um, you know, the, the nursery kindergarten model um, is heavily based on outdoor learning which naturally means investment in outdoor play areas, which the government have said they'll do. Um, and uh, also, you know, the rights of the child um, as well coming in, you know, to that development. It all sort of fits together in that way. Um, and remember, you know, the pressures that children face at school between the hours of nine and three when they're doing that formal learning, they're absolutely exhausted. You know, you're five years old. And I've heard some people saying, oh, they should get an extra hour at school so they can make up for any lost time. And I'm thinking, seriously, you're asking a five-year-old <laughs> who is absolutely exhausted through formal sitting at a desk, which is unnatural to any of us, you know, really um, doing all that. Imagine as an adult, I, um, you know, you've been at work from nine to five, say, um, and then your employer turns around and says, right, OK, as part of our COVID recovery, uh, you're now going to be expected to stay for an extra hour every single day at school. How would you feel about that? You know, uh, so you've got to flip what you know, what does it really sound like when people are putting these ideas out there? And by the way, you have to turn up for extra one-to-one -one, uh, work on a Saturday and a Sunday. You know, wh when are you going to get your leisure time? <laughs> you know, when is the right to family life <laughs> you know? and leisure and enjoyment, the joy of life and connecting with people? Um, so, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, we can provide and, you know, the Scottish Government has and continues to uh, invest in, you know, good quality, affordable childcare. Uh, you know, that is one matter. And, you know, education um, is that, you know, we should try and sort of not keep the two completely separate because obviously they're learning during childcare as well. But I would wish that people would see education for education's sake. <laughs> it's important enough for that. <laughs> well, CoCab, um, myself and Patrick would like to wish you all the best for the next coming weeks on the campaign trail and hope to maybe see you at, at Holyrood uh, and getting elected to Parliament. So we wish you all the best and thank you for joining us on A State of Politics. Oh, thank you very much to both of you. I've really enjoyed the chat. I hope it didn't go on for too long or anything, but it was really interesting to talk about some of the issues that I really care about. So thanks very much for the opportunity.